Okay, I'm gonna talk about the history why I started this. So initially, um, I think Google Google's protocol buffers started in 2008. So at that time, also my uh, the company I was working for, we were working on GWT and Jetty, the web server. So so basically, most of most of uh, uh, why it exists is because of our of the problems we had. So, um, okay, so, so when um, before we had to handwrite our server side classes and our client side classes, and we have to sync them together. So, after um, the project was over, I decided that. Um, we need a better tool, you know. Um, uh, why don't we just use a single code base from a proto file, and then generate the server side and client side classes? So that's what I did. From the the year after, uh, I started this project, and then I was using. It was not really a library yet. It was just a code generator for protocol buffers. So the goal was because the, uh, the client was GWT, so it's the browser. So we, uh, I had to, uh, because the, the, the default format of protocol buffers is the binary one, right? So with the generated class, I, I gener uh, the, the tool also generated another Another utility class to glue, to glue the JSON parts. So, the the problem with this approach before is that I also wanted uh, another format, you know, for readability. So, in order to still use proto protocol buffers, I had to generate another set of static helpers in order to uh, to have another format. So, what I did. Is I instead I, um, I instead I just made the implementation and interface. So before uh, many of us developer, uh, some developers also filed an issue in uh, the Google issue on Protobuf, and they 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 were um, they requested that they. Coded input stream class and coded output stream class. That's the that's the I/O classes, basically, uh, to make it non-final. Uh, basically, that means that um, if it's not final, then users can override the implementation and can implement their own format like JSON or XML or YAML. So, but the Google developers uh, rejected that idea primar primarily. Um, one, they didn't want any incom incompatibilities in the future with their API. So when they want to add another method, they don't want to break uh, the, the implementers. So it's, uh, it's another overhead for them. And secondly, for performance reasons, um, the final modifier on the input and output classes are, are uh, adds uh, optimizations. Well, the JVM has extra optimi optimization for the final modifier. Okay. So also, I wanted, uh, I implemented uh, the library also not only for serialization, but also for indexing. Uh, I was using the library as a serializer and also an indexer. So I was using it with my, uh, with a native database. So. Uh, what happens is uh, during serialization, there are hooks uh, in in your custom output that you can you can index certain fields uh, depending on your um, definition or your configuration. So, also uh, along along the way, as I tried to improve the library. Um, I also wanted, uh, because data in the database uh, at rest is usually if you want to serve it over the client uh, on JSON format, you have to um, get the binary data. 
and then you parse the and you construct your object and then using that object you write the uh, you write uh, JSON to the client so for for the library uh, I added another um, feature that allows me to read the data binary data and just transfer it on the wire without constructing any objects or any messages so uh, so that's the main goal is uh, avoid wasting resources to construct messages from binary data only to send them to the network for another format so this is the this is the uh, implementation it's a pipe so the primary use case is for transcoding so uh, it transfers the data from the input to the output while changing the format to what the client expects. So apart from that, you can also use it, um, yeah, this one, implement a custom output, and you can use it as a hook. So you can index fields at the time of serialization, or you can filter fields uh, during, during serialization. So this is how you would use the pipe. So assuming you got this from the data store, your uh, binary data, and then you construct this, uh, the link buffer is, you can, there's a static method that you can say link buffer that allocate default, which basically says you allocate 512 uh, bytes as a buffer. And then your output stream, your, your response to the client's request. So this is how you construct the pipe. Um, so, problem of IO util a new pipe. So the data is assume we uh, this is uh, protocol buffers data, uh, the binary data, and then with this, uh, if you write it to JSON, then you just transfer it JSON IO util that write to out and then pipe the pipe schema. This one for that get pipe schema uh, that is generated from the so from the Proto definition. So yeah, protobuf protobuf data written as JSON without instantiating a message. So also another use case that um, that I use protostuff personally is uh, I use a level DB database. Uh, it's basically a, a key value data store sorted. So uh, traditionally for JNI. Java native access, uh, uh, J Java native interface. Uh, usually, you just glue uh, for a single method in a, a native in a C++ method. You implement a Java counterpart, one-to-one uh, -one call. So what I did was um, implement a micro protocol where you uh, a single request would. Uh, so basically, for a single call, the, the you have to create a C++ method that streams the results. So instead of calling, if, if you're visiting uh, a key value uh, by, uh, by row, instead of uh, doing that JNI per, uh, per call, you can call it once, and maybe after 1,000 calls, depending on the buffer, you, you stream it back uh, to Java, and then you process that. You re-index, you re you add indexes, and then after the after reading the full buffer again, until the stream ends, you process it. So it's very efficient uh, in terms of if you want to avoid the overhead of JNI J Java Native Access. So extras um, over the years, people have. Um, requested that they use protostuff uh, with uh, Java simple objects like uh, plain Java objects existing objects and also they have also requested that it would handle um, circular references so by uh, along I, I kept delaying it and until there's so many users requesting that form a uh, feature then I implemented Protosoft Graph with, um, usually it's used with Protosoft Runtime. So you can use this um, 
if you have a big cache and it's and uh, and the objects are circular, then you can use this uh, as a binary format. So it's very efficient. It's uh, it's bit, uh, on the benchmarks, third-party benchmarks. It's, uh, I've seen uh, with the um, with the comparatively to other serializers that uh, handle circular references, um, the Protosub graph is the fastest. So that's largely in part of the efficiency of the protobuf format. So nowadays, um, who's familiar with um, flat buffers? Flat buffers, yeah. So the advantages of flat buffers is that you don't have to, to, to read a message. You don't have to parse it sequentially. You, uh, the, basically, you can read any parts of the data and I, I, I've been using flat buffers also. Uh, I've been trying to integrate it with Protostuff. So uh, as I've used flat buffers, I, I realized that I can also do this with protobuf if you, if you stick to the fixed fix, uh, fields, like the bool field, the fixed types, like the bool, fixed 32, fixed 64, float, and double. So how, uh, for important fields that I frequently access that I don't need to deserialize the message, uh, I use this technique. So for, for a sample message, you have a s string, and then you have, a, which is variable data, and this is uh, fixed, and this is also fixed. So with, with my generator, with my custom generator, uh, I generate this um, VU active is, uh, VO basically means value offset, and then that's for the fields. So act, uh, update TS is the is a uh, sixty four bit, and um, eight bit uh, active the boolean is eight bit. So one and ten. So the reasoning why one is we count backwards, and then and then the offset you start at the offset. So to to get the to get that data um, directly, and uh, this is how you do it. So you have a static method get bool. So this is the value offset, the vo, the generated the generated uh, fields. So in order to get the boolean field without serializing the whole message, uh, you do this. So so it's all relative from the back of the message. So the same applies to the other to the other field types. You just have, uh, for example, the other one was 64-bit, this one. So what you have to do is, starting this offset, you parse it, uh, parse the whole 64-bit and turn it into a long field, which is OK. So for the production users that directly inform me on GitHub, um, one is the JetBrains app source. Um, they're using, they're mostly using the proto, proto compiler for their um, front end code, which is basically, I think they're using GWT. And I guess one of the reasons is I was also using GWT and I, I put some sample code uh, on the, on the Go, uh, Google code project and it had already a base, uh, the data transfer objects for GWT was already there. So what they did, they enhanced it for their use case. And also Playtech is an online gaming betting platform that uh, they're, they're using basically the compiler and the serialization library. So they're using the Protosoft graph format for their, I think this for their cache and also for their data transfer objects from their client side and server side. Okay, that's it. Thank you guys. Uh, if you have any questions. So uh, I think I heard it somewhere that Protostop is more efficient than 
brought a C generated yeah, yeah, yeah. column, right? And you showed the benchmark. And so the reason was that at some point uh, there is a better algorithm. And I was a bit surprised that there is something nonlinear in Proto C. And is it like, can you talk a bit more about it? Oh, okay. So basically, with Protobuf, um, what they do is if uh, before serializ serializing a message, uh, they, uh, they, they, have, uh, they want to determine the size, the exact size of the message. So in order to do that, you have to traverse, example, if there's a root message, and then there's a embedded message field. So what they do is they uh, parse the whole, uh, traverse the whole object, and then for the fields, the inner message field, they also traverse that and then count, append, append the size of the child message in, into the root message and then determine the size. After determining the size, they then do the serialization. So it's basically you traverse the object graph twice in order to serialize. With proto stuff, because uh, mostly uh, what I did is the 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 computation of the size and the serialization is all done in one step. So in order to do that, um, I had to add an extra field uh, where you, when you serialize, you also update a size. So for every field that you serialize, you update the size. So, but the problem with that one also is that you have to have a buffer uh, that is mostly close to the size of your message, an estimate. So if, if, if the buffer you allocated earlier uh, is smaller, then that's what, uh, that's what the link buffer is for. So there is, uh, it, uh, the link buffer is basically um, a single link list. So a reference, uh, it has a field that points to the next one. So, so when, you serial, uh, when you serialize that into a link buffer, if there is an over, uh, the, the, the size is bigger, then the next message will point to the next buffer. So mostly, most of the time, if you, if you allocate your buffers that are large enough, there isn't much overhead. So that's when you gain the advantage. And even if there, isn't, uh, there is uh, overage, uh, you just, it's just a copy. So it's basically a trade-off. So you create a dynamic object later on if, uh, if the buffer doesn't fit. So you allocate memory, extra memory, but you exchange that in terms for speed. Yeah, you do the serialization and computation once. Okay. Any other questions? So why should we, should everybody use this instead of proxy? Um, my, yeah, this one, Actually, uh, there is, for me, there's nothing wrong with protocol buffers. Firstly, it was designed specifically for that use case, buffering. So um, I think where Google uses it is and when they transfer their network over the network. So they want, they want to, uh, for, uh, they have filters uh, in, inside their RPC server, so they, they want to, basically filter parts of the message. And also, with the prot protobuf format, um, the advantage is if you have the size, uh, if, it's, um, if the embedded message has a size inside, then you can easily skip it. With the native protosoft format, um, you have to, for the inner messages, you have to really parse it. So that's the disadvantage. So for their use case, they want to skip parts of the message and go directly to the important parts. So it works perfectly for their use case. So yeah. So there's nothing wrong with uh, using protocol buffers. And I, uh, I would advise you use proto stuff, the native format, not the protocol format for if you want to um, serialize, uh, for mostly for serialization, not really. Uh, you don't want to um, skip parts of the message, or yeah, you want to read the message as a whole. Mm -hmm. Could you show the benchmark? Oh, uh, the benchmark is actually online. I can show you. Hmm. 
links okay well that's loading Okay, still loading. Oh, bad format. Okay, so this is the graph. So it's actually the fastest if you, yeah. This is the native format. So cryo, anyone? Command plus six, I think, to make it bigger. Oh, okay. Command plus six. Oh. Command plus. Yeah. Not the Mac user. Ah, huh. command plus. Okay. Okay. So anyone familiar with cryo? Yeah. So it's actually a really good library also. And uh, I think in version one of Cryo, it was a lot slower than Protosoft. Then he figured out he was using basically um, byte buffers. So in his API, he had byte buffers. And all along, I knew that if you use byte buffers uh, directly, it is a lot slower than serializing with a native byte array object. So in his version two, he changed the, his library and turn it into accessing byte, a byte array directly. So that's why it's very competitive now. So, yeah. Is this something new that like uh, It's, I think we can see the last update of the, it's been here for a while, I think. Come on, minus. I think mostly this is also, because I don't do any marketing for this, uh, I think this is mostly how people find out about those stuff. Ah, I see. It's November 25. Yeah, that was the, and then there's another one with a, let me see. So this is the only plain data, no cyclic references. So first, this is the breakdown for serialization. Proto stuff is the fastest. And the serialization is still the same. I, proto buff is not here. So size, this is the one good thing about the others. It's uh, more compact. This is just the creation time. It's not. It's not really that important. And then let's see. I want to see where the one with protobuf here. So this is the one with protobuf in it. The protobuf format. So. Mostly, if you look at the gap, it's, yeah, the overhead of serializing twice shows a lot in this benchmark. You have to traverse twice. So with, uh, some of you are probably wondering why with a protobuf format, it's still very fast with my implementation. So I, I still, uh, I actually do the same. I count it twice, but there's a catch. Um, so this, this format is very efficient for small messages. So for messages, uh, no, I mean small nested messages, the, you know, the, the fields, uh, the message fields that are small in size. 
So if it's 127, the size is 127 and smaller, then the overhead is not, there's no overhead basically because it fits in a single byte. So what I do, because for the messages, it's dynamic, right? So for a nested message, uh, it could have a very big string field. So what, what protobuf that, the official protobuf does is, in order to be sure of the size, it computes the size of the nested message before it allocates the whole buffer. For my, uh, my strategy is, I assume it, that the message is small. So if it fits the small message, then there's no overhead. It fits uh, one byte, the delimiter, the size delimiter. So if not, what I do is um, I reuse the buffer, but I look, uh, basically if the buffer is this one, and then I use part, the half part, and then instead of using a contiguous array of buffers, uh, I, skip, I skip this one byte and then proceed. So it's basically the, your, your, the, the message in the buffer is no longer linear because you're skipping in the middle one byte. So in order to send it to the wire efficiently, or if you don't want a, the overhead of one byte, you have to copy it into another message and remove the one byte. So that's just that's the overhead. And also, also the wrapper for the, so it's for the buffer, to create this view, you have to create uh, another link buffer just to link between the two and skip the middle. So there's the overhead of the one byte and then the overhead of creating the wrappers, which is the link buffer just to connect. So for small nested messages, the protobuf format, my implementation is very good. Yeah, that's the trade-off. Now, is this in, is that, now in the byte array versus byte buffers, like NIO byte buffers, yeah. does that only apply to things like nested messages, or can this, does this also happen, is there also overhead with linear buffers, like in my case, my use cases, in this case, matrices? Matrices, yeah, ev everything. Everything with the byte buffers is slow compared to using byte array directly. What about, okay, what about, what about NAND? Because I know they do some, they do some stuff with unsafe and all this other. Yeah, yeah. So, Netty, uh, I I've heard lately they have they also have a native byte. Unsafe, yeah, they use yeah. direct allocation. Uh, yeah. That's what I use right now. Mm, yeah. So with the unsafe, you have a little bit of speed advantage versus the byte buffer. Yeah, you're correct. So if you use the unsafe only for certain fields like the float, double, fixed, uh, long, and int, but if you have string fields then it's a problem because you have the two double copying. So, yeah, that, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. That, that's I've the only... I've seen a lot of matrices over the wire, that's about it. Yeah, yeah, so if for numerical fields, the, the unsafe is very fast. Okay. I guess I'll do one more question now. So what about, what about communication with J and I? So I also do a lot with C plus and Java, like interrupt. Yeah. Like what have, what have you found is what have you found is the fastest there? Like do you still think it's gonna be unsafe because you can directly like, you know, cast a pointer and then just get it for a reference? Yeah. There's yeah, yeah. There's actually a hack I found. Um, there was this there's this Chinese developer who's developing against Nginx. You're familiar with Nginx? Yeah, the it's a web server, I see. So his integrating it with the JVM. So what I saw in this code is, usually if you in, uh, interface with JNI, and you use uh, pr primitive array critical, I think, yep. yep. So you have to release it after you use it. Right. So, but there is a way around that, depending on the garbage collector that you use, if you use a linear garbage collector, basically a single threaded one, so you can skip doing that, and there's a in there's an un, unsafe library where you can access directly the real offset of the byte array. Okay, so you have a byte array, and then depending on the JVM, the the offset is pretty constant. So if this is the address of the byte array, plus six usually from my test, it's always six. So when you pass that to the uh, to the native. 
interface to, uh, to see. So you don't have to do primitive array critical anymore. You just get that offset. And then, and then once you grab the byte array offset, you just uh, add it. And then you have the real array. So what is the name of that? Yeah. So this is the name of the project. I, I actually have this implemented also on my project, but it's not yet you know, open source. So uh, your Yeah, Nginx Glojure. Yeah, this is the guy who, who found the hack. And I've been using the same since, and I've been benchmarking it. And it's very significant, because when you do a release primitive array critical, yeah. there's some sort of locking, or bus there's a cleanup yeah. overhead. So right. if you skip that, there's and especially if you have a single threaded uh, pr process for data processing, it's very fast because no more locking. So essentially, when you're crossing from Java to C, there's no locks. It's the only overhead left is the, is the um, um, JVM trying to convert the object. To, uh, yeah, yeah. They serialize the Java object to native one. I, yeah, I, I still have to find that. Um, actually, I, yeah, I see. yeah, I didn't. Let's see, I think I can find it here. That's hard. Upset. Let's try to search. Wow. I think I remember this. Nope. I'll, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll find it. It's not. Yeah, it's OK. Yeah, I just need the, I just need the, I just wanted to get yeah. like, I know what you're going Yeah. Thanks. And save. It's here. Oops, not a very good Mac user. Mm -hmm. Okay. Get address. Oh, okay. So I think this is the one. Yeah, I, I saw that. Yeah, I saw the address and the offset. That's yeah, this is the offset. This is the static right. offset. So the R is, I think, a byte array. Yeah. Uh, the the offset of the byte. Yeah, the yeah the byte the byte array offset. The one with the relative offset, and this is the real. You append this uh, this static offset yeah. to that, and on the C side, so you get a pointer, right? Essentially, a J byte array. It's basically a a wrapper. Oh no, it's a pointer. So so you add the pointer, pointer arithmetic with the offset, and then that's the real address, and you can use it. OK, so to wrap up, basically, uh, with um, proto stuff, it's, it's good for if you use it as a serialization library, mainly. And if you're, if you're also, if you don't have, because with schema, with protobuf, uh, schema evolution is built in, right? So if you want to remove a sample in the future, you have a message field. And then you want to remove that field, you delete that field. The problem uh, with protobuf is very efficient because the size is embedded in the nested message. So you can directly skip it. Just, uh, just add the offset to the size, and then you can proceed to the next message. With proto stuff, 
the non-native process of format, you have to scan the entire contents of the message in order to skip it. So that's basically it. If, you don't if you're not deprecating a lot of nested message fields, then you won't feel any overhead. So it's a trade-off. Thanks. <laughs>